Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm really excited um, about today's session and it's um, my privilege to be able to interview, to introduce our speaker. Trond Unheim earned his PhD on the future of work and artificial intelligence and cognition from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He previously worked as MIT startup, uh, as the director of MIT Startup Exchange, where he also held a senior lecturer position at MIT's um, Sloan School of Management. He's the author of seven books. That's not a typo, seven books, four between 2021 and today. So um, I think we're all feeling a little bit like slackers. Um, he's a journalist. He hosts two podcasts, Futurized and Augmented. And last September, he joined CSAC as a research scholar within Stanford's Existential Risk Initiative. Today, he'll talk about some of his recent work since joining Stanford. Trond. Thank you so much. So I have only one goal today, and that's to convince you that this image right here of, of a water cascade has something to do with risk and it can teach us something essential. And if I've accomplished that, I feel like I've accomplished my mission. And the reason it's useful to start, I think, with a metaphor is this is not a subject where you can pull punches. So if there are any kids in the audience or online, um, this is not a talk for kids. But this room has hosted many talks like that because this is a center for security studies. But I wanted to illustrate a little bit that when I got this opportunity to come to Stanford, and I realized that a lot of the work that I had been doing over the years, as uh, uh, Professor Luby just alluded to, actually was somewhat related to risk and some, and even to security. But certainly, it was about emerging technologies. But you know, the other side of the coin for technology is you know the risks that it presents. Um, but this idea of cascades is not something that I invented. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about where that comes from. Uh, but you know, in a sentence, disaster research is sort of where, where the cascade metaphor has been deployed. Um, but in order to teach at Stanford, you need to impress students, but also, I guess, relate to students. So one of the first things that I did way before I got here was to say, well, how can I actually make this subject of systemic risk and cascading risks understandable? And I actually started with something as non-intuitive, I guess, as a board game. Uh, I have it right here. I just got the box for it. And um, the counterintuitive thing with a board game is that it, it of course, starts to uh, rattle the imagination a little bit. And what is better in a subject that is, I guess, so difficult to comprehend and where we both as an academic community and perhaps as a policy community arguably haven't come that far. Uh, what's better than a little bit of playfulness? So at least my students uh, told me they have enjoyed it. Um, you are welcome after to sign up and we can have uh, some play sessions. I actually uh, seriously intend to use this now uh, going forward to tease out some discussions that otherwise are a little bit tough to handle because this is not a light subject. We're talking about the end of the world. Um, and it is difficult, I think, to make that conversation light. Um, either way, this board game uh, makes it somewhat simple. So there's risks and then there's mitigations. And it challenges all players to both collaborate, but ultimately, um, obviously, fight for world domination. And it's set in 2050. And in this scenario, this game, just for the sake of it, um, we said we are in 2050 and there's only 25, uh, I think it says 29 here, uh, you know, city states left. And they are essentially all in ruin. And the uh, charge of the people playing the game is to rebuild these cities one at a time uh, and to succeed with that before 2075 without the world ending from more than six cascading risks. And these risks uh, occur in several areas that I have depicted here on the box, um, ecology, science, technology, social dynamics, uh, economics, and uh, ecology. All right. The research that I have started here um, 
has basically two main hypotheses. One is that these cascades uh, are meaningful even if they originate from factors that are not tremendously large at the outset. In other words, there's a mix of factors that go into uh, the risks that we are facing. And you can actually have an existential threat from a mix of small risks, which is where I think that where the water cascade metaphor comes in, because it doesn't really matter whether the cascade was caused by 500 small streams turning into a large cascade or whether it came from the Amazon plus 20 rivers. The ultimate result, of course, is the same thing. Number two, uh, which I think is even more important and also I think uh, gives a little bit of hope and, and that's certainly what I try to insert into the game is that half of the effort here at least is around the mitigation. And one of the shocking things in diving into a lot of the literature in this area is that 90% of it is all about the risks. People are obsessed about all of these risks, but comparatively little literature is about the mitigation or certainly about combining the two. So anti-fragility you know, is obviously a, a big hope here. There are many ways that we can react to risk. Um, and uh, you know, acceptance is, is one all the way to, to hedging, which obviously is a kind of a business strategy where you're playing both sides. I wanted to show you just a little bit because this is not a seminar where I'm presenting a lot of finalized research. Um, I guess I'm about the midpoint in this particular study, which means we have experimented here with eight different methods and they were not all planned from the outset. All the way from the board game that I spent a little bit of time on to you know, classic things like literature review in all of the fields that conceivably deal with risks um, to scenario planning, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and we're now about to sort of try to match these scenarios with quantitative growth indicators. And we have just found 25 of these and just projected all of these indicators to 2075. And we'll now try to combine all of these scenarios that you'll see in a second. Um, and add sort of quantitative uh, support to some of them and also mix them up. There is an ongoing survey, which I hope some of you have filled out. And if not, it's actually still open until the end of the month where we are asking experts in risk, experts in technology and um, people engaged in social movements surrounding risk. So including preppers and, and other folks they are a little tricky to get hold of. Um, so that's going on. The other surprise was that I found myself spending a, a lot of time on taxonomy development, which I will spend a little bit of time on in this talk. It was surprising because of course, here in this house, you are in an established field of security studies. Now disaster uh, and risk studies is also established, but when it comes to looking at systemic risks, many of the sciences that we are accustomed to are actually not that mature when it comes to analyzing the interrelationships and cascades between different risks. Which leads me to conclude that as a field of systemic risk, we are in a pre-paradigmatic state. And what do people do in that state? Historically, we were stuck with developing taxonomy. So it's a, a very, very early effort of science. Other way, let's jump into, um, and I'll show just a, a few seconds of, of each of these scenarios. And they are inputs, so they were created very early, so that um, they would take Human-induced climate change from the whole industrial era have accumulated to produce a mutually reinforcing cocktail of famine, extreme weather, war, and disease. Cascading effects of poor land use and primary predator extinction had wiped out 30% of 1850s biodiversity by 2040 and 50% by 2050, and has since 2065 left the earth without clean water and lacking in food. The earth has already been reduced to 20% of the 2025 population, with a population rapidly dwindling. So that's one of them. We created five of these. I'm going to just give you a quick snapshot. So the premise in all of these is that the world essentially ends in 2075 and we start in 2025. So they, they run for 50 years. 
we were not trying to reinvent the wheel here. The five are pretty standard scenarios. And you could say they aren't really about cascading risks at all. They all take as a premise that there's a tipping point that has to do with, like in this case, climate, or in this case, synthetic biology. And I'll just play that for you. But we felt like it was important to visualize this so that people answering the question aren't just faced with, you know, what if the world was ending? The synthetic biology breakthrough that fostered the crisis was discovered all the way back in the 2020s. It wasn't the technology as much as the 2047 lab leak and the rapid integration with nature in a vulnerable part of the world that caused Earth's ecology to take a nosedive. The synthetic compounds reacted adversely with photosynthesis and affected drinking water. However, it was the second lab leak from the Floridian Mars lab in 2067 that accelerated things. The impact of both leaks were initially subtle and almost untraceable. After a long incubation period, Earth succumbed to human-created synthetic. This is a growth and collapse. So the idea being um, the things in the beginning, you know, obviously. The buildup of exponential technologies well. paired with a plethora of natural and human-made disasters that characterized the last few decades towards 2075 were not all unforeseen, but the exact toxic mix came as a more than unpleasant surprise. It depleted global resources and pitted the world's nations against each other in a drive for ambition, domination, and for survival. The unforeseen chain of events that were precipitated by an initial period of nearly 30 years of exponential growth in technology, finance, and prosperity ended abruptly in a global contraction caused by a devastating blast from an energy X factor surrounding an energy technology that escalated from there into an extinction event. All right, and then we have uh, this week's big scandal, right? Runaway AI. Um, and our take here, we'll see in a second. The AIs that emerged in the first few decades after 2025 didn't have the capacity of general intelligence and were far from sentient. However, by the turn of 2050, things changed abruptly. Unforeseen changes started to occur, at first amongst the world's top 100 supercomputers, which by 2045 had all been equipped with quantum processors. But it was the alignment of AIs with certain social groups who financed their emergence and agreed with what we came to understand were the AI's intentions and agendas that made the runaway phenomenon possible. Enabled by humans, AIs became... And here, I think we're actually enormously conservative on the timeline, which is to, it's always not a very smart thing for a futurist to predict. The devastating the regional happen. war that began in 2055 decimated the world's two most powerful nations entailed widespread use of inexpensive, widely available weapons of mass destruction, unleashed the biggest standoff ever seen, and created detrimental ripple effects across the world, causing global financial collapse, nuclear winter, and near instant drastic population decline, escalating GDP declines, as well as causing revolutions fueled by disinformation in several countries. Globalization as a system of trade also became defunct and with. All right, so now you've seen uh, 30 seconds of each of these. They're, they're six minute scenarios. They're all video, but you can also see, see them on, on our website as narrative scenarios. Uh, they are by no means, you know, full fledged scenarios. But what you should realize, I guess, about scenarios is that they are really mostly inputs to a larger discussion. And that's in the spirit that I'm presenting it here as well. Uh, they were not produced to sort of say this is the last word. It is the first word uh, in order to start the discussion. And then eventually, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do more. Um, as I said, the survey is still open, so I'm not going to present the actual data. But here's just a little bit of a sense. And I guess the first question is pretty you know, uh, unanimous. That most people that answer the survey have the same kind of idea that cascading risks it, you know, is kind of the, the, the name of the game. Uh, this one is, I guess, slightly more disappointing in the sense that all of the scenarios were so, somewhat equally interesting to people. 
which essentially means that we failed if we thought we were being creative, but it also means that if we wanted to start a debate, at least we were not too far off of what people generally expected. And that was really the, the, the goal with these scenarios. Now, I think ultimately, if we continue with scenarios, we would be somewhat more creative and try to come up with things that not everybody has thought of in the first place. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to pr uh, present to you that you know we have this survey open. I think right now we have 185 responses. This is from a week ago. Um, I'm hoping to dip past 200. It is obviously not a, uh, you know, it's not a population sample. It's a strategic sample. It's an online survey. It's all only going to be indicative. Um, but I do think that there are not that many surveys on this topic. So any survey where you have demographic data. So we have details on, uh, you know, urban, rural, we have their gender, we have a lot of demographics that in this literature is actually surprisingly uncommon. People have, you know, we have studied what experts think about risk without thinking about traditional sociological variables. So this is one of the, you know, not first studies, but one of the uh, broader studies that actually has these demographic variables in it. Okay. So I've talked as if systemic risk is like intuitively understandable, but uh, the, the literature, as we then discovered, consists of a bunch of different people looking into this and they use very different terms. Here's my kind of one liner about who is concerned about these things. So essentially the economics literature is where systemic risk sort of originated. And this is where the too big to fail and all of that stuff you know, comes up. So risk to markets. And then there's, of course, risk science, which now, you know, is not just disaster uh, research, but a, a whole host of, of different perspectives that also include industrial disasters. So, you know, engineering schools teach this stuff. Even there's a, a professor here at Stanford that's a notable person in this area. Um, and I guess this center would fit into the, sort of the social science treatment of this, where risk to society is uh, sort of the headline there. Um, and a, a plethora of variables coming out from, from that research having to do with you know, inequality, health, weapons, obviously, as we uh, work on here, security and, and public health. And then you have the tech uh, area of emerging risks in all kinds of technologies. And I guess the overarching concern there is dual risk. So in other words, essentially any risk that you didn't think of when you were developing it for commercial or you know, governmental purposes. So it could be, uh, you know, misalignments of, of, of different kinds, or it could be malicious, uh, you know, intent. And then lastly, uh, from the ecology and environmental literature, uh, I think comes the, the topic of tipping points and uh, not just climate change, but biodiversity and the use of material and materials and waste. One question that really comes up here is, whether tipping points are necessary to start these cascades or if it indeed really is a scientific term. Um, as many of you know, tipping points kind of emerged in the literature around limits to growth, but it has now arguably also a, a very big place in, in the analysis of emerging technologies such as AI and has also now found a bit of a place in biology and, and energy terminology. But cascades, you know, it's one thing to present just the metaphor of a waterfall. Here's my best current attempt to describe what we're actually talking about. And, you know, it's early, early days to, to really uh, come up with a super definition of cascades, but it has a lot of aspects. I think I told you already that the suddenness of it is a very important factor. Um, Secondly, it appears like it is one flow, but of course it comes from different sources. Um, and then there's the question of causality, which is really tricky in systems research, because how on earth do you define which variable causes the other one? And this is not easy empirically. Um, and then you have the accumulation of damages, so the, the fact that you know, basically um, the end product is much bigger than the input. Um, and I think lastly that the, the issue of time scales is pretty interesting because there's an implication here of fast speed, early on, you know, fast onset, like in a market, 
or it could be slow onset as in a, a drought or a combination of fast and slow as in you know an epidemic either way however you spin this it is very clear uh, to most people who study these things, that it's far easier to look at the historical pattern than to predict these things. So, so that, that's really <laughs> quite challenging because the whole point of studying this is obviously to either mitigate or at least come up with some productive way to deal with it. And ideally before these tipping points start to happen. Okay, so having done I guess, literature survey of about a thousand papers, the state of the art in visualizing cascades is something like this. This is a fantastic paper by our good colleague, Luke Kemp, who's actually coming to campus in two weeks. Fantastic paper, horrible visual. Why is it horrible? Because even experts like myself, like mo most people in the room, have a hard time interpreting this. The colors are crazy, the arrows come all ways, and this is a simple one. Look at this. This is one of the climate models, an integrated assessment model. This is the simplest graph from an assessment model that I could find in the literature. And I would, I would say, blessed researchers, wonderful work, horrible visual, almost impossible to understand even for a climate expert. And if you thought that was bad, this, this is the award-winning 20-year-old running Image 3.0 project that is a core of the IPCC uh, climate work that won a Nobel Prize. This is the state of the art of how Dutch researchers see the climate evolution. And this is Nobel Prize winning stuff. I think we have a problem, certainly when it comes to communicating risk. And let's go to our own area of security research, the famous Afghanistan stability illustration, of which General McChrystal has quipped that if we understood this, we would have won the war. Question is, of course, did the people who made this graph understand their own graph? The colors, what do they mean? The phenomenon, what's going on here? Unclear. So that brought me to the issue of taxonomy and I started taking inspiration from another field. And without claiming that there's a direct analogy, just consider for a second that in the 18th century chemistry was a pre-paradigmatic um, science. Pre-modern chemistry was essentially, essentially alchemy. One of those alchemists was Don, John Dalton and he decided to structure this a bit, he was still using these uh, symbols, how oh, this is not showing up, the old uh, alchemy symbols, but he was at least able to structure it in some way. Now, it was a bit of progress, and for 30, 40 years, scientists in Europe were arguing over this, and were making some progress. This was a taxonomy, it was starting to make a big effort. But it wasn't, of course, until Mendeleev actually brilliantly put this into a table with the other brilliant uh, idea of leaving holes where he thought elements should exist. Because that's a big secret. Whatever you know, just admit that there's other things that you don't know that you leave for others to, to figure out. Either way, we know the history. This kind of approach led to massive breakthroughs. So is there a way that we could structure risks in that manner. Some of these categories are highly ambitious. Most of the data on there is made up. However, what if we could agree on a symbol for each risk? What if we could agree on a short terminology for them? What if we could at least start to gather what the ratio of impact and the ratio of likelihood actually would be for all of them and put it all together, what would then happen? So I thought, let's do this literally. Let's establish some colors. That would always mean the same to try to communicate this also to the public beyond science. These are the six factors that I think these thousand articles fall into. 
And this is the current state of what we've come up with. I would love your feedback on are these the right areas? Are these the right factors? And is there any way that we could put numbers to these? And what could we do if we had such a map? Who would govern such a map? For example, the periodic table is governed by an international association of chemists. Could we do something similar in risk research? And I even have a hand up. You can take a look. Would you mind? But risks is just half of the coin, right? So the other side of the coin is mitigation. And you know, it's a work in progress. So that map is considerably less developed and we're not finished by any stretch. I, I currently have something like 250 factors and those are just uh, 25 that I think uh, still you know, are on there for now. And we'll see if we can get to 118, which is I think the maximum that fits on a piece of paper. The magic would be to be able to describe in an enormously succinct way. So here's COVID for you, explained for high school and I guess elementary school students even. Deforestation should be mitigated by tree planting. This obviously should be the, the diamond instead. So I, in earlier versions, we had just a red circle for mitigation, but anyway, you start with sort of the key factor that you think is the trigger factor. You keep the colors aligned. You don't even actually have to have these signs because if they appear, it means they are either additional or, or multi, you know, multiplied. This is kind of a form of pigeon notation. And then we're also working on a more academically sort of similar to the uh, chemistry notation that actually could be computed. But this for now is just the pigeon notation that I imagine if this approach works, and I'd be curious to hear, uh, could be put, let's say the climate report comes out next time and has something like this as a visual abstract that actually explains to a policymaker or journalist what the factors are and how they are interacting. You can also imagine this for more complicated things like AI risk, where it obviously starts on the technology side, right, with perhaps an AI failure, you have autonomous weapons in there. You could imagine 2030 as some cutoff where, where things start to happen here. Uh, but then there are a lot of different areas on the social side, there are health consequences. Uh, there's even energy consumption impacts. And if you do it this way, even very, very complicated interactions can be structured and easily understood. This is the current banking collapse. I wrote this over the weekend when I was, my money in Silicon Valley Bank was frozen. So I spent the weekend, you know, agonizing of how to get that back. Instead, I wrote this little script. And um, yeah, I mean, you could see here that it's not just financial factors. It, it you know, was about to affect uh, a lot of things. Um, but it doesn't look so bad. And it's a very, very complicated phenomenon to explain. But if you keep the categories distinct, I think you can explain a lot pretty quickly. This would be my cascade for this month. You know, if you consider the recent news on generative AI, the state of inflation and these banks failing, the various wars going on in you know, Ukraine and everything else, uh, police violence, organized crime, uh, the recent uh, uh, you know, report from the IPCC that just came out, which was pretty negative, the fact that COVID is still mutating and uh, a pretty big explosion in inequality following many of these things. You could use such an analysis to then start to, to look at what would the tipping points be that could bring this system truly out of balance. And I'd be able to wager pretty confidently that we are you know, not very far from 1938 or, you know, essentially the beginning of other very, very calamitous events. But anyway, structure this way, hopefully, 
and oversimplified this way, you can at least start a debate. Perhaps not just among scientists, but among others. So my takeaway is essentially this. Um, cascading risks are complicated. Our project has currently not developed a theory of how they work. We are hoping to do so. But in order to develop such a theory, you actually need to know which variables to take into account. That was surprisingly not the case. The literature has an array of variables. It has something like a thousand variables that I came across. That is not manageable for science, even in the age of AI. So the question is, is it fruitful to look for a shorter set of variables without perhaps falling into the trap, which some of the literature is in this trap, and they say, forget any other risks. AI is the biggest threat to humanity. Let's all focus on that. I, for one, happen to think that that would be a massive mistake because the way that AI is implicated in so many other places, only focusing on one risk in one period of time is a very myopic way to go into the future. So lots of questions for you guys. What do you think of um, the sort of the meso level risk map that I have uh, put in front of you? Um, any ideas on how to take this further? Um, do you want to play the risk game? Lots of questions. Well, th thanks a lot, Tron. Um, why don't we start? We will um, follow usual protocol. Um, why don't you take a seat so yep. folks can see you? Um, and we'll start with um, fellows if they have any questions. Um, we'll start with him. We will use one finger um, if you have a new comment, um, two fingers to add on, and three fingers if you just want to make an amusing quip. So let's get started. Hey there, thanks for the talk. Uh, Ian Reynolds, pre-doctoral fellow here at CSEC and at uh, HAI. Uh, two questions. One is a lot of this seems to be rooted, at least the other models and kind of forms of nonlinear science, you know, small things add up to big effects. How do you think you're capturing those elements within this table? Or are you trying to kind of get away from this nonlinearity stuff um, and, and have it be more presentable? And second, a lot of the work in kind of more sociological domains of international relations tends to treat risks as things that aren't just stuff out there, right? There's elements of constructedness. You know, people are interpreting these risks. And how do you how do you kind of build that fungibility into to either this or or games like that you're designing? So thanks. Well, can I just jump? So I, I mean, nonlinearity is a is an enormous challenge. There, there's no implication in this sort of pigeon notation that I showed on the screen that these are uh, causal things. Like you do, even though you put them visually on a, on a map, you still would have to explain how you get from one to the other. So it's obviously very, very simplified. In terms of the game, the idea there is simply to have people think about um, whether there is a possible way that there could be a direct mitigation to a, a direct event. Now, in a game, you have to simplify it. You have to say, well, one card goes for the other one. If it's a world war, war, maybe you have to use three cards. It's like, you know, but you're essentially, you're not adjudicating uh, whether that truly would end World War III. You're saying, well, you know, you have humanitarian efforts and you have global diplomacy. I'll, I'll give you a point for, for ending World War. So that is the answer to the game situation. Um, however, even the game can bring this notion of cascades into play because at six risks, we, you know, you basically the, you know, the world ends. And there's also interaction effects between the risks that a game master can kind of bring out and, and would have to narratively explain that. In terms of the logic of the scenarios or, or the more academic work, yes, nonlinearity is, is the biggest challenge, but that's also the weakness of systems theory, right? Um, one of the reasons why I talk about meso level or mid, mid, mid range risk, so this is kind of Mertonian language in sociology, is that if you start talking about butterflies, you lose me. I, I, I just, I'm not interested in butterflies. I'm interested in them in my garden, 
I don't want to talk about them here uh, in a Center for Security Studies. So there has to be, you can, in my opinion, keep nonlinearity, but avoid degenerating into talking about butterflies. You need to have a level that we can say these are the factors, and there are many more factors than we are comfortable with. They are not related in a typical cause and effect way. There are systems effects and we don't have a good language for it yet. Um, but please, let's stay away from the butterflies. That's because that introduces hundreds of millions of variables. So, so now, we're, now we have to wait another 50 years until AI, uh, even way past quantum, where you can simulate entire worlds, right? That is next century's challenge. So, so, so then we can give up for now. Climate change, you know, all of that will happen, and then we can start talking about butterflies. Herb? No other policy? Thank you. Um, many things that you, you, you raise here. So I'm just, why the, I don't understand the colors in this. And you made a big point a couple of slides earlier about keeping all of this, the chains the same color. So can you explain that and, and how, the, how we're supposed to interpret this color coding here? So colors obviously introduce an, a level of non-linearity because uh, I mean, a level of linearity is an artificial choice to put a variable and, and assign it even to a category or a color. What I'm simply saying is if we don't simplify these things, we can't have a debate about them. I think it would be an advantage for the global community who studies systemic risks if we arbitrarily chose a color for a set of factors. If we chose a, maybe it's not six, maybe it's seven or nine categories of big uh, disruption uh, areas that we need to look for variables in. Now, I don't care if it's blue for technology and, and green for ecology, that's, that's not the point. My point is simply, if you looked at the way we have been visualizing really consequential things that matters to the future of humanity, can we not even agree on what color they have when we represent them? Because if we cannot, I have testified in three different parliaments. And I can tell you the challenge there is that policymakers don't even understand the internet. But when I was testifying in the Portuguese parliament not to out a certain nation, my biggest challenge was, was not non-linearity. My, my biggest challenge was that I, I had to start with what is the internet. So we have a significant challenge here in communicating what we're doing. Um, and I think we have uh, the onus is on us to actually produce something simpler than we are doing right now. So yes, this doesn't solve any pro you know, all of the problems, but I think it's an argument in a debate of why not? Why couldn't it be this simple? Okay, so, so there are names of each of these colors, right? I mean, one of them was technology, the other said, you said was environment, sorry. What are the names? What is blue and silver and purple and so on? What, what do those colors correspond to? Blue is technology, green is ecology or environment. Um, gold is economics. Okay. Orange is social dynamics, anything to do with social. Purple is uh, health and uh, the gray or uh, silver is uh, governance. Yeah, so some. We have a question over here. Thanks, John. Super interesting. I, I wanted to ask about the scenarios and sort of how you think about using scenario analysis. Um, because I've been involved with a number of groups that have used scenario analysis, usually looking up five years and not, you know, um, more than 50. Hard enough. Um, and, you know, usually you say, you know, what are these, what are the uh, plausible alternative futures? How did we get there? So on. Um, so you made the decision, at least as what you showed us, of these are the plausible alternative futures through which there are different mechanisms that lead to the end of the world. Right. Um, right? Okay. And 
uh, I suppose, in fact, you, you could end up with more than one half. I mean, you could really have the end of the world multiple times because, you know, they're plausible and different ones could come to pass. But w did you think about using scenarios where things turn out better, the world doesn't end, and then comparing what leads you to that better outcome as opposed to the one where it's all over? Yeah, yeah, the short answer to that is that is yet to come. So these scenarios were so-called input scenarios. So they needed to be extreme, but plausible and also represent the broadest possible sort of commonly understood risks that one could conceivably come up with. But then obviously 2075 uh, had a different re rationale. So 2075 wasn't chosen because we as a research team think the world will end then. It was mostly because beyond 50 years, you cannot have any data. Even the projections we did for these 25 indicators, uh, a lot of it is conjecture, right? So we, we picked these 25 indicators based on whether they have 10 years of solid data that we can project or more, 20, 50 in many cases, where you can project upon, based upon you know, historical trends. When you go beyond 50 years, essentially beyond predicting population, I don't think there's anything else that could be predicted. Um, so if you look at the questions in the survey, we have the same question for you know, which scenario is interesting. And I ask, uh, what about 100 years into the future? What about 500 years? What about 3,000 years into the future? And very, very interesting how people's uh, pessimism actually uh, you know, increases drastically when you go beyond 50 years. Essentially anything beyond 200 years. I didn't show you that data, but it's pretty scary how, and these are people who individually said they are happy people, because I also have that as a question. These are optimistic, happy, 25% uh, PhDs. They're probably representative of the people in this room. They are optimistic, happy people, but uh, by 20, uh, you know, by 2,225, uh, they think the world's going to end. Scott, and then Rod. Uh, I have a, a quip and then a uh, suggestion. Uh, the, the quip is that one in Lewis Carroll short story, he tells of a map maker who says that he has made the perfect map. Uh, it is a one-to-one -one ratio between the map's size or the map representation of an object and the object. Only problem is you can't open it up. And if you do open it up, it covers the entire globe and covers and, 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 uh, uh, and covers uh, everything that you're trying to look at. And I worry that this taxonomy has a characteristic like that, which makes it interesting and fun, but hard to really understand rather than illuminating. So. To me, simplifying something by taking these different factors and saying, are there characteristics of them that makes cascading and cascading risk and mitigation efforts, cascading risk more likely and, ri and mitigation less likely would be really helpful. So um, Cameron and I, for example, were very much influenced by Charles Perrault's two by two categorization of risk saying that it has to do with the complexity. Can you really understand it all and therefore predict common mode errors, et cetera? Right. And the tight coupling, that is, is there time in which you could do a mitigation effect or would something happen? Could you take each one of these and categorize them in that way and therefore get a handle on the relationship between individual factors here in terms of cascades versus mitigation, what would be the example? Damming, I guess, would be the, the way that you could stop a, a, a waterfall or something. So number one, I deserve that because the honest and someone who tries to simplify, if the end result is that you were confu as confused as you were before, I agree, if it's a one-to-one -one map and, and, you know, indeed, that's why I kind of said this is in the middle of the project. I would love if there were even less factors on that map. Uh, there should be a ledger uh, to, to Herb's point uh, about what the colors represent. This is a starting point. And you know the, the slides that were shown in terms of how you use this framework are, are not fully developed in any way. So I agree it has to 
if this is going to communicate beyond this room, it has to be much further simplified. And also the, the different sort of paths and the illustrations of how it could be used need to be drastically improved. So I deserve the quip. Uh, do you have any ideas for me on an individual area where we either have data where we could try to use this uh, issue or where you would encourage us as a research uh, sort of community to find the data and try to use this kind of approach? I would just su suggest that you could take each one of these individual factors yeah. and map it in terms of complexity and, and um, tight coupling. So Perot has this chart where he says, here's where nuclear power plants are, here's where aviation is, here's where uh, nuclear weapons are. And you could do something for each one of these that would help you in that. And then the challenge would be to figure out, well, how do you combine them? There are two. Are there things that are, are there combinations that add to complexity or are there combinations that actually add to mitigation capabilities because they push in the opposite direction? So, I mean, that's a brilliant comment. I think I was too quick when I went through this. Uh, I just wanted to explain one thing. So it starts up here with, you know, alien attack, which is the end of it all. But singularity is kind of the top. And that is because the combined impact is the highest. So the way these are ranked is they're ranked by impact for each category. So singularity is how I currently rank as the biggest tech risk, closely followed by nuclear winter, AI misalignment, and extreme bio risk. So if you were to simplify things, you could say, which I think the literature in those fields already say, which is, you know, singularity and AI misalignment is the only thing that matters. That's what I'm going to spend my career on. And, you know, here at CSAC, you know, nuclear winter matters a lot and other types of geopolitical security and, you know, extreme bio risks is matters a lot to the bio risk community. Um, similarly, you know, on, on governance, it's geopolitics breakdown is sort of high up here and on economics, it's, you know, for example, uh, financial depressions and credit crisis and stuff is, is very high up uh, on e ecology, uh, carbon emissions is high, biodiversity, and on health, uh, I guess fertility collapse is kind of what I put as the highest risk. You know, if it was to continue, it, you know, it would all end very easily right there. And on social dynamics, I think population growth is the biggest factor, followed possibly by some ideas around social movements and, and inequality. So uh, the idea though is that it, we haven't just listed the enormous high impact risks, we have taken it much further and that's where the mid range aspect comes in. So for scholars like Harold who study organized crime, organized crime may not be viewed as an existential risk, but on this kind of map, it deserves to be there because it is an intermediary factor and it also is an insidious thing that we don't seem to be able to get rid of. So it deserves to be put at the same level structurally as these kind of end of the world uh, factors. I, I don't know if that really is helpful, but that's the way we were thinking around the map. Herb has an add on. Just on Scott's um, uh, comment, I mean, the, 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 the power of the periodic table of chemistry is that it implicitly contains information about how the elements will interact with each other. Right. Okay. And if you have some way, I mean, when, when you talked about cascading risk, the, the, the image that that calls to mind is A leads to B, A and B lead to, coupled together lead to C and, and you know, and, and, and something like that. That, that's the image. I, is, first of all, is that the right image that you want to be called to mind? No, but that is the simplest image. I want to change that image into something somewhat more complex. But right now but we don't. That's included in what you're in your. Simple it is image. included. Okay, so, so if you had some way of a, some parameters in there that would suggest how these factors could interact with each other, that would be really helpful. Uh, you know, some rules or or, or probability or something uh, that would. Uh, illustrate the, the connections between them. I agree. And I would be very disappointed if at the end of next year, I at least don't have a theory about that. That is obviously what, what I'm aiming for. 
uh, I am not here to present that to you. But yes, thank you very much. That is exactly what I'm, we're hoping that this is a step one towards getting to. Rod? So first, thanks for a very provocative uh, uh, presentation. So my comment uh, echoes what Scott and Herb have already said. And I start by observing that in a cascade, some of the streams of water are much larger than others. And what's missing for me in this taxonomy is a sense of uh, those issues that have the greatest impact. And um, there may be ways to, to handle that. Uh, the various symbols say being of different sizes, some metric, uh, and the metric uh, wouldn't only be just number of people who die, uh, but uh, the number of museums that are lost or, you know, whatever the uh, existential event, um, where does it leave uh, civilization? What, what is lost uh, from, from humankind? Now, another approach that uh, goes to your analogy with the periodic chart, um, is to, as, as Herb has mentioned, Mendeleev could only do this because he had a, a pretty complete, an amazingly complete knowledge of the properties of individual elements. And so the rows and, and columns uh, make sense and he could uh, tell where something was missing. So in terms of complexity or the possibility of events interacting, if you took your color scheme uh, pared it down and came to some understanding, say, of whether certain types of existential events have a low probability of interacting. That would be the uh, noble elements uh, to the far right on the periodic chart. Right. And, and so if you um, had a way of graphically representing the scale of the effect plus the probability of interaction, uh, then uh, I could ponder a diagram. Uh, at this stage, it, it's hard work to go read each box and then I don't know quite what to make of. So, I mean, these are brilliant comments. I just want to point out that what I had envisioned here was that if there could be some sort of agreement in some way in the wider scientific community that cares about this, and there's about nine different scientific areas that this affects, it's not a small thing, I would foresee some sort of organization or standards body that starts to either own the whole thing or individual researchers start to own individual factors. Because there, I have started to try to map the current understanding of the probability of AI misalignment, for example, and I have started mapping the articles that already have put a ratio to that probability. But with 120 factors, that work is not something for one research. So if you think that that is required, which I agree that it sort of is, this is a work for about a thousand researchers for about the same amount of time it took us to do the human genome project. But I think it's equal in importance. So the problem here is more, is this worth the challenge? Could it be structured in the way of the human genome project? In which case, I would gladly uh, take a role here as one of the thousand and, and you know, own one factor <laughs> myself. Just a quick comment, sorry to keep harping on the periodic table issue, but I worry that um, the periodic table metaphor is doing more harm than it is helping in this. Uh, a lot of the power from that comes from understanding of the properties of elements and the fact that they work in a certain way, which doesn't have to be the case. So left to right, you're filling orbitals, uh, top to bottom columns, you're introducing new orbitals in the periodic table. It's easy to imagine a world where orbitals fill differently and the table is a poor way to represent that. Uh, so I, I'm, 
a little confused here because it seems like you're starting with the organization of a table, uh, assuming two dimensions of variation. But actually, in what you've told us now, there's just one dimension of variation shown here, which is kind of the magnitude of the risk involved, which makes me wonder why you're starting with a table in the first place and whether it might not be best to start with a list. And then if you do see commonalities or ordering on another dimension, move to a table, or you might need something three or more dimensional if that's the case. So I think I deserve that one too. To be honest, I, I think there's a loose uh, inspiration from the table. And as this talk has proven, it is provocative enough to at least get you to debate with me. So I feel like I do have you on my court. But on the other hand, I agree with you that the dimensions are not clear. And there is no logic here yet that is at the level of an atomic weight or, or any other relationship that was pointed out. So uh, this is very pre-paradigmatic. I don't think perhaps the, the word periodic uh, comes in yet. It is more of a visualization and a beginning inquiry into what the relationship between these risks needs to be. Uh, and it has a logic of, could there be uh, you know, a, uh, an impact uh, sort of axis? And, and could there be a structure? There's two relationships that I am counting on here. One is the severity of impact, and I'm actually arguing the opposite. I'm saying we should not just focus on the ones we think have the biggest impact, because that obviously is the cascading argument. And number two, I think the classification into whether it's six or, or 10 or four different sort of groups of factors is important because it re if reflects back to important things in the social system and scientific system that we're dealing with. So it, it reflects, it's a model of reality, obviously, and you can argue whether these six you know, are, are useful in system science, uh, but without this model, we have nothing. Because then we're back to you're a physicist, I'm you know, whatever social scientist, and we don't communicate about these things. Yet we go to the UN and vote up and down, and, and you know, the world either ends or, or doesn't, and, and we're not you know, able to actually communicate about it. So I, I think you're right. Uh, this is probably not a periodic table, but at least uh, you humored me with the discussion that it perhaps could be. Harold. Great. Thanks so much, Trond, uh, for uh, again, uh, what everybody think, has said is a very provocative discussion. I wonder if, if one of the things that could be done in a talk like this to basically help you get your point across, and maybe table's the wrong way to lay this out, would be to actually go back to your six scenarios or five scenarios that you laid out originally and actually build visual cascade that would plausibly lead to each of them so you could illustrate how you might use the relationship between the different factors. And then you'd have less things on the screen. You could use different sizes to represent, you know, magnitude and impact or probability or these different factors. And you might actually be able to visualize this as more than a two-dimensional thing. It might actually be, you know, multi-dimensional. You don't know until you do it. But I think that illustration linked back to the original would actually be very helpful, I think, for an audience to understand how you propose representing these plethora of risks and would create that cascading effect and there would be many steps to it. Would I present some causal relationships or hypothesized causal relationships from the literature review? I think a lot of this could come out of the literature review that you've already done to then end up with, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. The literature says that these are the nestle level risks that could possibly group together to produce this end of the world scenario that you have. That's a fantastic that be, idea. It's a fantastic concept. Thank you. Grasp what you're trying to do uh, uh, concretely in a different way. Perfect. So That's a great suggestion. Question. We don't have time for all of the questions um, that are that are in the chat. Some people are wondering um, whether this is available for sale or not. Um, but let me um, just give you an opportunity to respond to Decker Walker's question. This looks like a situation where hundreds or thousands of Monte Carlo simulations should be run with the aim of finding which conditions most commonly appear in the resulting catastrophe in order to reduce those and mitigate overall risks. Your thought? So I think my thought is that quantitative analysis of these kinds of phenomena are premature, but I would also love to be there. And I think Monte Carlo is probably a 
oversimplified version of looking at these things. Uh, at least I've come to that conclusion that we are not there yet, that the kind of simulation that I'm looking for is in the, belongs to the quantum age. Uh, and that we are now at more at a level where we can reason around which factors we have to deal with. And that the quantification step is, I think we can work on the terminology of it. And I, and I think the people's comments here on the nonlinearity is obviously challenging because mathematics and nonlinearity is, is complex. But I, I, I think I wanna shoot down the Monte Carlo argument. You, you can do some statistics based on this, you can do some machine learning, but the current paradigms, you know, generative AI and language models, notwithstanding, we are not equipped. We don't have a quantitative paradigm yet that can face these kinds of risks. Well, I wanna thank you very much for presenting today. Um, uh, and, and thank everybody um, for their thoughtful contribution. And we hope your scenarios don't play out before we meet again next week. <laughs>